Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Well, everyone, and welcome back to the Pat Flynn Show. We are going to try something interesting, I think. I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read to you from C.S. Lewis today on pride. And the reason I'm doing this is, number one, I'm thinking about starting a weekly segment where I read through some of my favorite books. And part of the reason I want to do this is because I'm often asked for book recommendations, and I have at least done a few episodes on book recommendations. But I thought, you know what, people are busy. You're commuting to work anyways. You're listening to this podcast anyways. So maybe we could read through some books together. So if you like this, if you think that this is an interesting episode, and if you think I do a decent job reading this chapter from C.S. Lewis then send me an email, patflynn at chroniclesofstrength.com, and and maybe I will start that segment. It'd probably be a a once-a-week segment where I read through one to two chapters at a time, depending on the book that we're working through. And I think that working through, and I think that would be, I think that would be a lot of fun. So we'll we'll test it out here. The chapter I'm going to read from C.S. Lewis is on pride. And I've been wanting to do an episode on pride for a long time, especially since becoming more aware of of just how prideful of a person I I am and how damaging that has been to my life over the years until I became aware of it and all the things I've been doing to to try and humble myself. Um, It's it's really a sneaky sin, and it's something that I want to spend time on in this episode, or at least let C.S. Lewis spend time on, because his chapter called The Great Sin in Mere Christianity summarizes this so well that I figured, you know what, I'm not even going to try and explain it. I'm just going to read this chapter because it's just so well done. Uh, But before we do that, it's St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Uh, A few fun fun facts about St. Patrick that I found on the internet, and they must be true because you found them on the internet. I thought I would share these with you before we dive into the chapter here from C.S. Lewis. Um, let's see here. St. Patrick, number one. Mm-mm. Let's scroll up. Sorry. I should, I should have become more prepared. I'm, I'm just often so disorganized when it comes to this, um, to this podcast. Uh, anyway. All right. St. Patrick wasn't Irish. How about that? He was not born in Ireland. I actually knew this. Patrick's parents were Roman citizens living in modern day England or more precisely in Scotland or Wales. He was born around 385 AD. By that time, most Romans were Christians, and the Christian religion was spreading rapidly across Europe. Next fact, St. Patrick was a slave. At the age of 16, Patrick had the misfortune of being kidnapped by Irish raiders who took him away and sold him as a slave. He spent several years in Ireland herding sheep and learning about the people there. At the age of 22, he managed to England where he spent 12 years growing closer to God. Next fact, St. Patrick used a shamrock to preach about the Trinity. Many claim the shamrock represents faith, hope, and love, which, as we know from Sunday school, are our three cardinal virtues, or any number of other things, but it was actually used by Patrick to teach the mystery of the Trinity, and how three things, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, could be separate entities, yet one in the same. Isn't that fascinating? It certainly beats an example, like the Hydra, as an example. Obviously, the pagan rulers of Ireland found Patrick to be convincing because they quickly converted to Christianity. Um, legend says St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland, but that's probably not true. There's no reason to think that snakes or evidence, uh, evidence of snakes ever existed in Ireland and the climate being too cool for them to thrive there and whatnot. So anyway, scholars suggest that the term snake may be figurative and refer to pagan religious beliefs and practices rather than reptiles or that something. Next fact, Patrick's color is actually blue. The original color associated with St. Patrick is blue, not green as commonly believed. In several artworks depicting the saint, he is shown wearing blue vestments. King Henry VIII used the Irish harp in gold on a blue flag to represent the country. Since that time, and possibly before, blue has been a popular color to represent the country on flags, coats of arms, and even sports jerseys. Isn't that, isn't that something? Isn't that something? Okay, so those are some facts about St. Patrick. Let us now turn to pride. So I'm going to read from um, chapter 8, and this is from Mere Christianity, and, and this chapter is called The Great Sin. 
and it's on it's on pride so i'll read through this and then maybe we'll have some comments at the end um i'm just waking up i've just had my coffee so hopefully i'm this brings me back to when i had to record the audio audiobook of my recent book and hopefully i won't record the audio audiobook of my recent book and hopefully i won't mess up as many times as i did with my own book because I'm not going back and editing that out, so you're just going to have to live with it. But I'll, I'll read as straight as I can, okay? Chapter 8, The Great Sin, by C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity. I now come to that part of Christian morals where they differ most sharply from all other morals. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which every one in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people, except Christians, ever imagine that they are guilty themselves. I have heard people admit that they are bad-tempered, or that they cannot keep their heads about girls or drink, or even that they are cowards. I do not think I have ever heard anyone who is not a Christian accuse himself of this vice. And at the same time, I have very seldom, seldom met anyone who was not a Christian who showed the slightest mercy to it in others. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular, and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves." And the more we have it in ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. The vice I am talking about is pride or self-conceit. And the virtue opposite to it in Christian morals is called humility. You may remember when I was talking about sexual morality, I warned you that the center of Christian morals did not lie there. Well, now we have come to the center. According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Does this seem to you exaggerated? If so, think it over. I pointed out a moment ago that the more pride one had, the more one disliked pride in others. In fact, if you want to find out how proud you are, the easiest way is to ask yourself, how much do I dislike it when other people stub me, or refuse to take any notice of me, or shove their oar in, or patronize me, or show off? The point is that each person's pride is in competition with everyone else's pride. It is because I wanted to be the big noise at the party that I am so annoyed at someone else being the big noise. Two of a trade never agree. Now what you want to get clear is that pride is essentially competitive, is competitive by its very nature, while the other vices are competitive only, so to speak, by accident. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better-looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good-looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition has gone, pride has gone. That is why I say that pride is essentially competitive in a way the other vices are not. The sexual impulse may drive two men into competition. They might just as likely have wanted two different girls. But a proud man will take your girl from you, not because he wants her, but just to prove to himself that he is a better man than you. Greed may drive men into competition if there is not enough to go round. But the proud man, even when he has got more than he can possibly want, will try to get more still just to assert his power. Nearly all those evils in the world which people put down to greed or selfishness are really far more the result of pride. <clears throat> Take it with money. Greed will certainly make a man want money for the sake of a better house, better holidays, better things to eat and drink, but only up to a point. What is it that makes a man with $10,000 a year anxious to get to $20,000 a year? It is not the greed for more pleasure. $10,000 will give all the luxuries that any man can really enjoy. It is pride, the wish to be richer man can really enjoy. It is pride, the wish to be richer than some other rich man and still more the wish for power. For, of course, power is what pride really enjoys. There is nothing makes a man feel so superior to others as being able to move them about like toy soldiers. 
What makes a pretty girl spread misery wherever she goes by collecting admirers? Certainly not her sexual instinct. That kind of girl is quite often sexually frigid. It is pride. What is it that makes a political leader or a whole nation go on and on, demanding more and more? Pride again. Pride is competitive by its very nature. That is why it goes on and on. If I am a proud man, then as long as there is one man in the whole world more powerful or richer or cleverer than I, he is my rival and my enemy. The Christians are right. It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. Other vices are. You may find good fellowship and jokes and friendliness among drunken people or unchaste people, but pride always means enmity. It is enmity. And not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. In God you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people, and, of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. That raises a terrible question. How is it that people who are quite obviously eaten up with pride can say they believe in God and appear to themselves very religious? I am afraid it means they are worshipping an imaginary God. They, theor they theoretically admit themselves to be nothing in the presence of this phantom God, but are really all the time imagining how he approves of better than ordinary people. That is, they pay a penny worth of imaginary humility to him and get out of it a pound's worth of pride towards their fellow man. I suppose it was of those people Christ was thinking when he said that some would preach about him and cast out devils in his name, only to be told at the end of the world that he had never known them. And any of us may at any moment be in this death trap. Luckily, we have a test. Whenever we find that our religious life is making us feel that we are good, above all, that we are better than someone else, I think we may be sure that we are being acted on not by God, but by the devil. The real test of being in the presence of God is that you either forget about yourself altogether or see yourself as a small, dirty object. It is better to forget about yourself altogether. It is a terrible thing that the worst of all the vices can smuggle itself into the very center of our religious life. But you can see why. The other and less bad vices come from the devil working on us through our animal nature. But, but this does not come through our animal nature at all. It comes direct from hell. It is purely spiritual. Consequently, it is far more subtle and deadly. For the same reason, pride can often be used to beat down the simpler vices. Teachers, in fact, often appeal to a boy's pride, or as they call it, his self-respect, to make him behave decently. Many a man has overcome cowardice or lust or ill temper by learning to think that they are beneath his dignity, that is, by pride. The devil laughs. He is perfectly content to see you becoming chaste and brave and self-controlled, provided all the time he is setting you up in the dictatorship of pride, just as he would be quite content to see your chillblains cured if he was allowed in return to give you cancer. For pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. Before leaving the sense, before leaving this subject, I must guard against some possible misunderstandings. 1. Pleasure in being praised is not pride. The child who is patted on the back for doing a lesson well, the woman whose beauty is praised by her lover, the saved soul to whom Christ says, well done, are pleased and ought to be. For here the pleasure lies not in what you are, but in fact that you have pleased someone you wanted, and rightly wanted to please. The trouble begins when you pass from thinking, I have pleased him, all is well, to thinking, what a fine person I must be to have done it. The more you delight in yourself, and the less you delight in the praise, the worse you are becoming. When you delight wholly in yourself, and do not care about the praise at all, you have reached the bottom. This is why vanity, though it is a sort of pride which shows most on the surface, is really the least bad and most pardonable sort. The vain person wants praise, applause, admiration, too much, too much, and is always ambling for it. Angling for it. It is a fault, but a childlike and even, in an odd way, a humble fault. It shows that you are not yet completely contented with your own admiration. You value other people enough to want them to look at you. You are, in fact, still human. 
The real black diabolical pride comes when you look down on others so much that you do not care what they think of you. Of course, it is very right and often your duty not to care what people think of us if we do so for the right reason, namely because we are so incomparably more, rather because we care so incomparably more what God thinks. But the proud man has a different reason for not caring. He says, why should I care for the applause of that rabble if their opinion were worth anything? And even if their opinions were of value, am I the sort of man to blush with pleasure at a compliment like some chit of a girl at her first dance? No, I am an integrated adult personality. I've done has been done to satisfy my own ideals, my own artistic conscience, or the traditions of my family, or in a word, because I'm that kind of chap. If the mob like it, let them. They're nothing to me. In this way, real thoroughgoing pride may act as a check on vanity. For, as I said a moment ago, the devil loves, quote, curing a small fault by giving you a great one. We must try not to be vain, but we must never call in our pride to cure our vanity. <clears throat> Second point. We say in English that a man is proud of his son or his father or his school or his regiment, and it may be asked whether pride in this sense is a sin. I think it depends on what exactly we mean by proud of. Very often in such sentences, the phrase, the phrase is proud of means has a warm-hearted admiration for. Such an admiration is, of course, very far from a sin. But it might perhaps mean that the person in question gives him airs on the ground of his distinguished father or because he belongs to a famous regiment. This would clearly be a fault. But even then, it would be better than being proud simply of himself. To love and admire anything outside yourself is to take one step away from utter spiritual ruin, though we shall not be well so long as we love and admire anything more than we love and admire God. 3. We must not think pride is something God forbids because he is offended at it, or that humility is something he demands as due to his own dignity, as if God himself was proud. He is not in the least worried about his dignity. The point is, he wants you to know him, wants to give you himself. And he and you are two things of such a kind that if you really get into any kind of touch with him, you will, in fact, be humble, delightedly humble, feeling the infinite relief of having for once got rid of all the silly nonsense about your own dignity, which, you made, which made you restless and unhappy all your life. Trying to make you humble in order to make this moment possible. Trying to take off a lot of silly, ugly, fancy dress in which we have all got ourselves up and are strutting about like the little idiots we are. I wish I had got a bit further with humility myself. If I had, I could probably tell you more about the relief, the comfort, the taking off of fancy dress, getting rid of the false self, with all its look at me and aren't I a good boy, and all its posing and posturing. To get even near it, even for a moment, is like a drink of cold water to a man in a desert. 4. Do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call, quote, humble nowadays. He will not be a greasy... He will not be a greasy, smarmy person who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. Real interest in what you said to him. If you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of how anyone who seems of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud, and a biggish step, too. At least, nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. Well, there you have it, my friends. Sorry for the couple of hiccups there. <laughs> But that was chapter eight from uh, Mere, *Mere Christianity*, called *The Great Sin* by C.S. Lewis. What a, what an amazing writer he was! So clear, so concise, always right to the point. And I, I wanted to read that to you, um, both from a personal standpoint, um, because he, he's right. He, five, ten years ago, if I thought I was a proud person, I probably would have denied it. Uh, so I mean, that last line um, is 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 so is so accurate.
if you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. And 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 in true C.S. Lewis fashion, he, he does such a good job of clearing up common misunderstandings, of, of really defining what, what pride is and what it isn't, because sometimes we use the, the term in an ambiguous sense. And But most importantly is he, he points out that that pride is inherently competitive. And I think it's very interesting when we look at some of the other vices that he talks about, that that, that, that even some good things can come out of out of bad behavior sometimes. You know, he gives the idea of, of friendliness and, and, and drunkenness and intemperance or things like that. And certainly we've all experienced that. Um, but pride is, is inherently competitive. It, it, you can only be proud to the extent that somebody else is held beneath you. And that's what makes it so dark and diabolical, as, as he calls it. And it's something that I've been trying very, very hard to fix in myself um, through a lot of awareness, meditation, prayer, and, and practice. And it's, it's not easy. <laughs> of course it's not. Why, why would it be easy? But it's worth doing and it's and anything that's worth doing is is worth doing well. So that's why I wanted to I wanted to read this to you because I think it paints such a, a clear picture of pride in a way that a lot of people may not have considered it before, um, or at least not in such detail or nuance. So, anyways, I'm going to leave it there. Relatively short episode. My wife is cooking a St. Patrick's Day breakfast, so I have to scoot down for that. I hope this was helpful to you or at least interesting. If you would like me to perhaps start up this series of reading and we might even just start with this book maybe we would start with mere christianity of of taking one to two maybe three chapters uh, of a book per week and working our way through together Um, i would probably read it and then give some some notes or study questions uh, kind of like a class wouldn't that be fun kind of like a study class if that sounds interesting to you uh, let me know drop me drop me an email pat flynn at chronicles of strength of strength.com Alternatively, if you really want to let me know, if you really want to make me happy, head over to iTunes, uh, leave a five-star review there or on Stitcher, and say that you enjoyed this episode, and I will be eternally grateful. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.